Praise the Lord, saints. Amen, amen. We are continuing in our series, Words of Encouragement. I don't know about you, but I have certainly been blessed by this, this series of words of encouragement. We all need to be encouraged. And so we'll continue today, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I was trying to get up here and tell you before you sat down to remain standing, it would save you from an up and down. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and 15. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And all of God's people said, Amen. Our gracious and heavenly Father, again, we are thankful and grateful for this privilege that you've given us. We pray now that we would open our hearts, our minds to receive those things that you have for us in your word, that we would have a life transforming and changing experience through this worship. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. John Whitecliffe says and quoted, the gospel alone is sufficient to rule the lives of Christians everywhere. Any additional rules made to govern men's conduct added nothing to the perfection already found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. John Whitecliffe was reminding us that all that we need to live a Christian life is found in these scriptures that God has revealed himself to us. John Wycliffe stated that, and I'm, I'm reminded when we go through these texts and we're talking about Christian conduct, my father used to tell my brother and I there was a subject that you had to make straight A's in. There was one thing that you had to have a straight A, and there was no tolerance. B's were not acceptable. It must be an A. What math? Wasn't English, thank God. Wasn't science. It was conduct. In some places they called it citizenship. But that grade had to be an A. My father reminded us that you may not be able to master all of the subject matter, but all of us should be able to behave properly. The Apostle Paul is continuing to provide the church at Thessalonica that they too must make an A in conduct. That there are some things that we as Christians must continue to do to conduct ourselves in a way that's pleasing to God. Last week's message, we were told we were, we were requested, it was more of a request to appreciate leadership. And then at the end of last week's message, in, in that 13th B verse, B part of the 13th verse, it says to live peacefully one for another. And then we lead into today's text, which is just a continuation from last week's message about how we should conduct ourselves and how we should live our lives. And the text outlines a few things that we just have to do. And the first one is, he says, we must admonish or warn the unruly. We must admonish or warn the unruly. And that word unruly would indicate one that is out of line, out of line. You see, in, in, in the military, we were required to be in a straight line. And we would have to do dress right dress. And that meant that you would stand at attention and you'd put your hand up and everybody would line up on that line. That would make sure that everybody was in line. The Lord is telling us, and we are being given guidance, that the word of God is the line. The word of God is the path that we should be following. And there are people that uh, Paul is addressing to the church and says, you know what? Some of you are out of line. Have you ever heard that? 
They were out of line. He's saying here that we should admonish or warn them. 1 Corinthians 4.14 says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And he writes to the church at Corinth that had a number of problems. Paul's letters were addressed to teach and give sound doctrine and guidance on how to line up. But in addition to that guidance, in addition to that teaching, Paul is reminding them and warning them by admonishing them that there is a consequence and there is eventual punishment uh, for those who fall out of line. That you have to pay some consequences. And he's saying that you must warn the people. Not just teach, but warn. I'm reminded of the prophet uh, priest Ezekiel warned those that were in Babylonian captivity that when the watchman sees the sword coming, he must blow the trumpet and warn the people. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to when we see someone out of line to warn them and remind them that their lifestyle is out of line. And, you know, we don't like to do that. I think I think it's difficult for us sometimes to to practice that and to to do that, to see our brother and sister that's out of line. But 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 if we really love someone and if we really care for someone and we see they're about to do something, we ought to warn them. I'll never forget growing up in Wichita Falls, 1109 Fuller Circle. I remember when I first got my first bicycle and I took the training wheels off. Boy, you couldn't tell me anything. Boy, I'd ride around that circle and ride around that circle. But my father and mother would say, there's one thing you cannot do. Do not ride the bike in the street. Do not ride the bike in the street. You know what I did? Yep. <laughs> I rode the bike in the street. And guess what happened when I was riding the bike in the street? A car came wheeling down the William Street, which was right across the street from our street. When I got into the street, it was just by the grace of God I was not hit by that car. And I said, thanks be unto God that I didn't get hit. Unfortunately, my mother was in the house and saw what occurred. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I heard, didn't I tell you and warn you about riding that bike in the street? As brothers and sisters in Christ, it's, it's not easy for us to do that with each other. But if we love them and, and care for them and we see them behaving in a way that could be dangerous to them, we have a responsibility to warn them. And so that's one of the things he says that we must do as part of our Christian conduct. And, that, and those words that he's using here in the Greek, he, it's not optional. These are must requirements. These are things that we, we must do. And then he goes on to tell us in the text to encourage the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted, those that are timid or in low self-esteem. The NIV referred especially to those who had a low opinion of themselves. Those, the idea here is the description of a person who feels their resources are too small for a given situation. They are despondent or discouraged, could be faint-hearted and timid. But my brothers and sisters, can I just share with you that life can throw trials and tribulations where there are times in our life when all of us will be faint-hearted, when all of us feel like I'm not capable and able of hate handling. And thanks be unto God that we are that way because you know what? Our strength comes from the Lord. And we need to recognize that that's where our strength comes from. We need to recognize that there will be things that happen in our lives that we just can't handle. There are some things that we just know we have to depend on the Lord. And it says to them to encourage them, to encourage them. And that word encourage comes uh, uh, with the root word of come alongside to help them. There are all of us in times in our life when we need to be encouraged. 
There's times in our lives where we need a brother or sister in Christ to come alongside us and encourage us and let us know that things are going to be all right, that we can continue to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we see our brothers and sisters or hear about our brothers and sisters that are going through something in Christ, we ought to go beside them, pull alongside of them by either telephone call, it could be a card, it could be just simply a pat on the back saying, I understand and I'm with you, but we have a responsibility to encourage one another. Oh, it's nice to be encouraged, but you know what it's better to do is to be an encourager. Paul is reminding that we'll run across people in life that need to be encouraged. And, and the other thing he tells us is we have to help the weak. We have to help the weak. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Mark 6 and 34. When Jesus saw them, he had compassion. My brothers and sisters, how many times do we see someone in a destitute condition? It ought to cause us to have some compassion in our heart of what is it that I can do for this person? Now, uh, many people would say that when we talk about helping the weak, he's talking about something physical. So maybe it's a disease or a physical impairment or financial hardship could make someone weak. But I believe when I read the text in line with this uh, conduct of a Christian and looking at what the church at Thessalonica and some of the Christians were going through, I believe this refers to being spiritually weak. Those that were struggling to follow the Lord, those that had been taught the scriptures, those that had heard the word, those who had been given the guidance, but yet they were weak and, and were being tempted and pulled and tugged on in life and said they weren't as strong as they needed to be spiritually. And as a result, we're told to help them to help them grow in Christ, to help them to get back in line, to help them to grow stronger in the things of God. And one of the things that we can do is let people know when we have been weak, when, when we have had issues in our lives, to give a testimony to someone, to tell them, let me tell you about what happened and let me tell you how the Lord helped me. Let me tell you how I was strengthened by a scripture or let me show you or uh, uh, the, read the word of God to them to help to encourage them, to let them know it's going to be okay. Yes, we need, we need to be an encourager and we need to make sure that we are helping those that are weak. A weak person, especially those that are new in the faith, need to be fed regularly and need to be cared for. They haven't quite learned how to truly trust in God and depend on him in all things and for all things. And we need to make sure that we as, as Christians are being strengtheners uh, to strengthen those who are weak, to strengthen those who need the help, to strengthen those new believers, to make sure they provide the uh, word of God. That's where our Sunday school and our Wednesday Bible study comes in helpful to make sure that people are being nourished in the word of God because we need that strong word of God to strengthen us. And that's the reason that we have the Wednesday night service. That's the reason the Sunday school teachers are preparing each and every week to deliver the word of God to those Nothing that they would be. Everlasting. Yes, everlasting. <laughs> And you know those type of Christians where when they're in church or they're around other believers, they are walking with the Lord. But then when they leave church, they get out into the world and they're pulled and tugged. Those are the people that we need to help. Those are the people that need to be encouraged. And we need to teach them and, and stand behind them to help them to be able to stand firm. And all of us, if we'll be honest, had a point in our spiritual walk where we needed that where we needed help. And so it's now time for us to be helpers. And then he goes on to tell us that in the text that we need to be patient. We need to be patient and long suffering. He says there with everyone. Be long suffering with everyone. 
And that word patient comes from two words, long tempered and also understanding that if we are long tempered, that means we don't have a short fuse. You ever seen somebody that had a short fuse? Yeah, There's, there are people who it doesn't take very much for them to just go off. Yeah, all you got to do is just say one thing wrong with them. And I'll never forget, and I'm not gonna call the person's name, I, that wouldn't be proper. But there was this one person who almost looked for something. And I'll never forget, some things were happening and I was telling them about what was happening and I was trying to turn the other cheek. I was trying not to return evil for evil. And so I was telling this person about it. And you know what the person told me? I wish such and such would do me that way. <laughs> In other words, he was saying there was no way I was gonna turn the other cheek. There was no way I would let somebody treat me that way or let somebody talk to me that way without them giving me a piece of my mind. And you know, there's a lot of people who won't hesitate to give you a piece of what? Their mind. But you know what people need to hear? They need to hear the things of God, not necessarily a piece of our what? Mind. James said, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And if we were looking at a family analogy, how many of you, how many of you have ever changed the baby's diaper? <laughs> Mark, you couldn't raise your hand. Mark said, no, not me. If you've ever changed the baby's diaper, how many of you criticize the baby for spoiling the diaper? No, no one criticizes the baby for spoiling a diaper. Nobody criticizes a baby for spitting up. You know, they used to tell my children, my wife would say, just pat them on the back and it'll help them. Just pat them on the back. Well, I don't know why when she patted them on the back, they burped. When I patted them on the back, they spit up. So I don't know if I was doing something wrong, but I would not admonish that child because I recognize that they're growing, that they don't know better and that eventually they'll grow up and stop that behavior. And even when a more mature Christian does something to offend or wrong you, we have to come to the point and realize, you know what? I'm a sinner. God has forgiven me far more than the things this person has done to me. And so we need to be patient with people, not just the infant or immature Christian, but even the mature Christian can do things that could cause a problem. And for the mature Christian and for those of us in Christ, and we talked about this or I did last week, when somebody offends you or somebody does something to you that bothers you, go to them one-on-one -on -one in a loving spirit and let them know to help them grow and know that uh, you were offended and not to return evil for evil. And that's hard for us to do, isn't it? That whole concept of getting slapped and turning the other cheek but in Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus tells us that's exactly what we should do. Turn the other cheek. And then he tells us to, to love them. Love them and pray for them which persecute you. So we have a responsibility to love those that are being mean spirit to us. Pray for them. And what would we be praying? What would we be praying? that they would remove this bitterness and anger from their heart and it would be replaced with patience and kindness. And then he ends up, as he gets ready to close, he says, seek good for all people, even those that have evil intent. Seek good for all people. After, after commanding us, don't repay evil for evil, Paul adds, seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Seek after. What is it that we could think about? What is it that comes to mind that we could do good for one another and for all people? The first thing that came to my mind when I thought about this, when people are struggling and people for hurting, you know what the best thing that we can do? You know that one good thing that we can do? Is tell them that there is a Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. To introduce them to the Lord. When there are people who need help, when there are people who are hurting, when there are people out there 
that have evil intent toward us, we have a responsibility as a Christian to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. And that's difficult to do. It's difficult when people have been mean to you. It's difficult when people are persecuting you. It's evil when people are, are doing things to you that uh, would offend you. It's easy to say and get angry and upset, but what does the word tell us we should do? We should tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. Introduce them to Jesus. That's the one thing we can do as a Christian because there's only one thing that can change the heart of a person. And my brothers and sisters, in the day that we live today, every time I turn on the news, every time I look at television, every time I look at the Facebook, every time I see what's happening in our society, there's one thing that I'm sure of more and more each and every day is we as the body of Christ must be about the business of going out and telling everyone about Jesus Christ. Who needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ? Those that are evil, those that don't walk with the Lord, those who have evil intent. And that's what Paul is reminding us here, that each one of us, when we leave here, we should be looking for opportunities. And then when people come to us and they mistreat us, that's a perfect opportunity for us to return evil with love. And sometimes just our behavior can make a difference. Sometimes just being kind to someone when they're evil to you can be a witness to the love of Jesus Christ in your life. Hopefully at your work, on your job, or wherever you go, people know that you're a Christian, that you're a follower of Christ. And perhaps you've already witnessed to them. Perhaps you've already talked to them about the love of Jesus Christ and how he turned your life around. But you know, sometimes in life, what people need to do more than hear a word of God, they need to see it manifested in our lives. Amen. They need to see us walking and not just talking. And that's what Paul was reminding us. As he concludes about our conduct, we should live our lives in such a way that we are a living, walking testimony of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want to get an A in conduct. I want to get an A that when I stand before the Lord, that he says he was pleased with my walk. And it's not easy, but with the strength of the Holy Spirit and God in our lives, we're able to live our lives in a way that would be pleasing to God and be a living example for others. It is my prayer that today, if you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not sure or certain that you would die or you're not sure that you go to heaven when you died, that Jesus Christ died for you. And then if you're here under the sound of my voice and, and you've accepted Christ and yes, you know that you're walking with the Lord, you know the fact that you're gonna go to heaven then the question is, who am I spoke to lately? Who am I witnessed to recently? What person did I see and tell them about the love of Jesus Christ? And my brothers and sisters, each one of us, each one of us should make a conscious effort when we leave here to be able to, between now and next Sunday, say, this is who I talk to about Jesus Christ. You don't have to tell me about it. You don't have to tell Brother Larry about it. You, you could if you'd like to share. What's most important is that we recognize it's our responsibility to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if each one of us take that seriously about our witness, I believe we'll have better communities. I believe we'll have a better state. I believe we'll have a better nation when those people of God stand up and conduct themselves in the way that God expects us to behave. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we've come before you just acknowledging that you have a will and a way for our lives, and we pray that we would line our lives up with your will, that we would do those things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask all these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I'll tell you what. We've got just a few minutes. We got just a reminder about the baby bottles for Father's Day. And if you don't have a baby bottle, that's okay. We'll, we'll take a check. We'll take cash. You don't have to put it in the baby bottle, but we'll do that. That, that, that ministry supports our pregnancy center. For those of you who've already contributed, thanks be unto God. I think the report last week was we re already received $1,000. Praise God. For those of you who've already, amen. It's all right to praise God. 
But if you have not contributed, please contribute something. Just something. That's why they gave you a bottle. If it's just change, put it in the bottle and return it. When we bring it all together, it's a blessing for God. I wish Etta was here right now. I wish Etta was